This morning we are looking at uh, Matthew's gospel. A little bit of a change, but as you understand, this is an evangelistic service this morning, so we're deviating a bit from what we have been doing in the gospel of Mark. But we're going to uh, one of the parallel gospels, that of Matthew, to look at uh, something we actually saw not too long ago in Mark. And that is the idea that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. I, I would have you turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to be looking at the closing verses of this particular chapter. Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 through 58. Would you listen carefully to this? This is God's word. And it came about that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. And coming to his hometown, he began teaching them in their synagogue so that they became astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. May the Lord uh, make his word a blessing to our souls this morning. Now, I, I think uh, perhaps you understand that um, uh, Jesus' ministry lasted for about three and a half years. And throughout the, uh, through that time, Jesus basically evangelized the whole land of Palestine. The first couple of years were actually years in which Jesus was quite popular, years in which he was well received. Uh, the people were amazed by the things he was doing. They listened to what he had to say. And many people, of course, responded and, and followed him. This was the time of Christ's popularity. This was before the leaders of Israel began fully to understand who it was that Jesus was claiming to be, and actually many of them saw who he was and still rejected him. This was before they began working against him uh, to turn the people against him. But Matthew tells us that there was one exception to that, that even in the days of his popularity, there was one group that had a difficult time listening to Jesus and they happen to be from his hometown. And when you stop and think about it, uh, who could have been a better communicator of the gospel than the Lord Jesus Christ? Who could do it better than him? There had never been such a popular preacher, such, such a talented or more powerful preacher in Israel before Jesus. And even as good as some of those were that actually rose after Jesus Christ, those we're familiar with in the history of the church, such as Whitfield and Spurgeon, none of them have ever come close to the kind of power that Jesus preached with because he was anointed with the Spirit of God above measure. And yet, notwithstanding all of those things, all of those advantages that Jesus had, being the Son of God in human flesh and having such power, these people would not listen to him, at least for the most part. Now, why wouldn't they listen to him? Well, the reason that Matthew gives us is the fact that they knew Jesus too well. They knew who he was. They knew where he was from. They grew up with him, as it were. They knew his family. The text says they knew his father, Joseph. Now, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph the carpenter? Now, you and I know that Joseph was not Christ's uh, real father, but rather his adoptive father. We know that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary before Joseph and Mary had ever come together. That Jesus is the Son of God, not the Son of Joseph. That God the Father is His Father from all eternity. That Jesus Christ is God the Son. And since He was supernaturally conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the Spirit of God, He is also called the Son of God. As to with regard to his humanity as well as his divinity. But the point is, they didn't quite understand that, of course. They didn't know that. They weren't convinced of that. But they did know Joseph, and they believed that he was his father. They also knew his mother, Mary, very familiar with her, 
the other children that Mary had also had with Joseph, James and Joseph, Simon and Judas. And as you know, this was not the Judas that betrayed him. And they also knew his sisters. They knew that Jesus grew up among them. They knew that he spent his early years working with his father, learning his trade. And they also know that he didn't spend his time in the schools of the rabbis, that he hadn't been an educated man. And yet, of course, he had this wisdom. Now, they didn't know anything against Jesus. They had nothing against him personally. Jesus was not like us, after all. He didn't do the things that we did while we were growing up. I mean, those who saw our early years, especially our teen years, and um, maybe the years of our early adulthood, are very familiar with all of our flaws and would have had perhaps a hard time accepting that we were messengers sent from God. But Jesus didn't have that particular problem. He didn't have that flaw. He had never done anything wrong. He had never done anything that was even questionable. Jesus was perfect in absolutely every way. So what was their problem with Jesus? The problem was simply that they knew him, and that was the only thing that was in their way. That's why they were offended when he claimed to speak for God. Now, they had a hard time receiving the gospel from him, from Jesus. And maybe that is why some of you who have heard the gospel before haven't yet come to Jesus. Maybe it's because you know the people who have tried to bring the gospel to you too well. Maybe your parents. I'm sure that uh, all of you who are parents have been trying to bring the gospel to your children. And you children know your parents have been trying to communicate it with you. Maybe it was them, and maybe you're having a hard time because you know your parents so well. Or maybe it was somebody you grew up with, a brother or sister that was converted to Christ who's trying to tell you now about the gospel, or a friend that you had, uh, one that you knew perhaps quite well as an unbeliever, and uh, now they're a believer. Or maybe they've been a believer for some time, and you were raised in the church. You have a hard time receiving from them because you know them so well. And you know they're not perfect. You've seen the mistakes that they've made, the sins that they've committed. You know, when people see you do things that are wrong as a Christian, and they know that you claim to be a Christian, sometimes they begin to think that you're being somewhat hypocritical. And maybe they've had a hard time listening to you. Maybe you've, you who haven't heard or haven't listened to the gospel are having a hard time listening to them when they've tried to tell you because they are not perfect. Of course, you need to realize that even if you're not aware of anything against them, even if you actually do respect them, you still sometimes don't listen just because you know them. Again, Jesus was perfect, and there were people who didn't listen to him. The old saying, familiarity breeds contempt, is true, even if we don't want it to be true. Sometimes you would be much more likely to listen to a complete stranger than to the people you know simply because you know them and you can't believe anything to be true or great or something great about them. You can't believe that they are really taking these things seriously. Now, for those of you who might be in that particular situation this morning, here's a couple of things that you need to think about. The first one is that the real problem with your listening to the messenger is not with them. The main problem is not with them. It's with your heart. You won't listen because you really don't want to hear what it is that they have to say. And the second point is simply this, that the message that they bring, the one that you don't want to listen to, is really the only message that can change your heart and save your life. The Bible says that all of us have sinned. We've fallen short of God's glory. God is offended with us. We are his enemies, and he is, a matter of fact, our enemy, unless we find a way to be reconciled to him. Now, the Lord has made a way that we can be reconciled, and that way is through the gospel through what his son has done to bring man back to God. That message you don't want to listen to is the only message that can actually 
save you. So let's consider both of these truths for just a few moments. First of all, you need to see that the real problem is with your heart and not with the messenger. If you don't want to hear the message, you will not listen to it. It's just as simple as that. Now, we've already seen that it's not that the messenger does not matter. The messenger, as a matter of fact, does matter. I think all of us have people that are in our lives that we don't want to listen to. When you lose respect for somebody, when you begin to think that they're hypocritical, it's hard to listen to anything that they have to say, especially in the area that they're having problems with. Again, if someone claims to be a Christian but they don't live a perfect life, you can look at them as being hypocritical and you don't want to listen to them. But familiarity, as we've already seen, can also be the problem. If you know somebody too well, it's hard to take them seriously. Sometimes it's hard to take them seriously because they, it's hard to believe that they're really taking themselves seriously. You realize, of course, that the gospel does make, uh, well, it does tell us of things that we can't see with our eyes and uh, things that require faith to believe, although the more you know about it, the, the more you understand, you can't really believe any other way. These things have to be true. But when you're telling somebody who's never heard these things that live in a completely secular society that has blocked all these truths out, sometimes it seems like you're just coming from outer space. And they have a problem sometimes with the message on that account. Well, in some cases, because of this, uh, this problem of familiarity, sometimes it might actually help you to hear the gospel from somebody else rather than somebody that you know well. You know, we're always talking about friendship evangelism. And friendship evangelism is actually quite important. It's a good uh, and effective means of communicating the gospel. But from what we're reading here, there is a point at which your familiarity with someone can become too great and they won't listen to you on that account. So we do have to be careful in that regard. As a matter of fact, we might say that just getting to know people as you're, as you're just getting to know them, that might be the best time to communicate the gospel to them. You're much more likely to listen to someone you respect than somebody you don't. And sadly, as we get to know one another more carefully, we seem sometimes to lose respect, uh, especially if their life happens not to be consistent with the message that they're bringing. Now, that's re one reason why we who are Christians here this morning, and I mentioned that there are things that are here that should be helpful to us as well as to the unconverted person. Sometimes you should try to reach out to the people uh, that, that aren't related to you and the people that aren't so close to you because perhaps you'll have a better opportunity to be heard by them. I mean, we're talking about uh, oftentimes reaching out to our family members and friends and sometimes people who even come to this church. But do we realize that the people who bring them sometimes are so familiar to them that they're not willing to listen to them but they might be willing to listen to you with regard to the children even. Sometimes it, we're not going to be the ones, the parents aren't going to be the most effective uh, communicators of the gospel to the children, at least at a certain point in their lives. When they're very young and they respect their parents, they do listen to you very carefully and they accept every word that you have to say, which is great. But you realize that they grow, uh, as they continue to grow and learn, that they reach a point where they begin to question everything that you've said. That usually happens in the teen years. And they begin to put everything to the test and they challenge everything. And it seems like you have to prove it now. Before they just accepted it, now you have to prove it. And that makes it somewhat difficult. It makes it difficult for them to receive it from us, especially if there should be anything amiss in our lives, which is why it might be helpful for us actually to reach out to one another's children. Being careful, of course, not to usurp the parents' authority or their rules. So we need to be careful that we, uh, the parents agree with what we're doing. But it can be helpful as we seek to live Christ before them, as we seek to communicate Christ to them, they may listen to us when they don't listen to anyone else. I used to be of the mindset that perhaps, um, you know, 
the, the family is the best uh, environment for children to hear the gospel, and it certainly is at a certain point in their lives. But when they reach their teen years, the idea of hearing it from someone else in something like a youth group becomes very helpful because they may listen to that youth leader in a way they don't listen to you as parents. Sadly, that's just a truth, that, you know, something that, that is factual. That is what happens in life. So think about that idea. Sometimes it's helpful to hear the gospel from someone you don't know quite as well, but yet somebody you still know to some degree and that you respect. And we might be that person. You might be that person for someone else. So you should try to reach out to them, just as Brian tries to do it for uh, his friend's children. We need to try to reach out to other people and bring them the gospel. So the point here is the messenger does matter, at least to some extent. But the point I'm getting at here is this. On the other hand, you need to realize the messenger is not the only problem. Now again, who could communicate the gospel better than Jesus Christ? And whose life was more consistent with the message that he was bringing than Jesus? But even though he was perfect, and even though he had done miracles, they still rejected him. A perfect life, a perfect message that's perfectly delivered, even miracles to confirm that the message is true, you would think that these things would be enough to gain the best hearing. And yet, they weren't enough. And why weren't they? Well, familiarity was partly to blame, but not entirely. The real problem was in the heart of the hearers. They just didn't want to hear the message. Now, when someone comes to you with something you want to hear, that you're already disposed to hearing, that you're glad to hear, it doesn't really matter whether you like the messenger or not. It doesn't matter who they are. You'll listen to them if it is good news and if it's something that you really want to hear. But when somebody comes to you with something that you don't want to hear, it doesn't really matter how much you like the messenger, you're still not going to listen to the message. The problem is not entirely with the messenger. The problem is with the heart. And if you haven't listened to the message, the problem is with your heart. You have heart disease, we might say. It's not the kind of heart disease that we often hear about uh, you know, on television, the news and so forth, the kind that is um, you know, going to threaten your life, although perhaps uh, some of you might be struggling with that. But you have a spiritual heart disease. It is a disease of the soul. And the Lord actually has quite a bit to say about that in His Word. And this is either true of you now, or if you're a believer here this morning, certainly was true of you at one time before the Lord had mercy on you. This is what the Lord says. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Paul says in Romans, there is none righteous, there is none who does good, there is not even one. Now this isn't a problem you came by in life, this is something you were actually born with. David writes this in Psalm 51, 5. I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Now, this wasn't just true of David. This was actually true of all of us. We were all born in this condition because of Adam's sin. Paul writes in Romans 5, through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men. Because you have this heart problem, because there is darkness in your heart, you want nothing to do with Jesus, which is why you're, just, you're indisposed toward the message. Jesus says in John chapter 3, this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Now the light of God, which is basically his truth, doesn't shine any brighter than it shines in the gospel. 
And that's the reason why you don't want to hear it. Because you don't like the light. You like the darkness rather than the light. The messenger is not the only problem. The main problem is with your heart. So again, the messenger does have something to do with it and can have sometimes a lot to do with it. Even a perfect messenger sometimes won't be heard. But you need to realize that the messenger is not the only problem. The message is not the problem. The heart is the problem. Now the second point is this. That this message that you don't want to hear is the only message that can change your heart and save your life. Uh, there are reasons, after all, why, why, why your parents and your, your brothers and sisters and your friends are actually trying to reach out to you with the gospel. Now, the first reason is because the Lord has commanded that they do this. Now, God doesn't delight in seeing people uh, die in their sins. Uh, the Bible actually tells us that this is something that God takes no pleasure in. He says in Ezekiel 33, verse 11, Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Do you realize that that's the reason why the Lord actually ordained that the gospel go out into the world in the first place and why it be preached to every creature? Is because God wills that everyone repent and be saved. Now, we know that, that, that God wills that by way of command. And he hasn't actually ensured that each and every individual is actually going to repent and believe the gospel. But God's will is, as he considers the soul of each and every individual and what will happen to them if they die in their sins, his will for them is that they repent of their sins. Because when God looks at a soul suffering in hell, he doesn't delight in the fact that that soul is suffering, that one who was made in his image rejected him and remained his enemy his entire life. I know sometimes that can be difficult to understand from a perspective of God's sovereignty, but it is in fact true. Now, God, of course, has this worked out in his plan, and this does glorify his justice, and in that God is pleased. But with regard to the suffering of that individual by itself, he's not pleased with that, which is why he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. And so he says to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation in order that they might turn from their sins and be saved. So one of the reasons why your family members and friends, why these messengers are bringing the message to you is because this is what God desires. But another reason why they're trying to reach you with the gospel is because they love you and they're concerned about you and they know what is going to happen to you if you do not listen and turn to Jesus Christ. The Lord says the wages of sin is death. And this is not just physical death. That's what we all experience. But he's talking here about eternal death. The Bible says a day is coming when the Lord is going to gather everyone before him and he's going to judge them on the basis of what they have done. Those who have heard the gospel, those who have heard the message of reconciliation, those who have trusted Jesus and turned from their sins, the Lord will bring into the new world that he is going to create and he's going to bless them eternally. But those who haven't heard the message or those who have heard but have not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, he is going to throw, the Bible says, into a lake of fire where they will be justly punished for their sins for the rest of eternity. John says in Revelation 20, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now the point is this, the Bible says you have sinned. Every single one of us here this morning have sinned. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And for those sins, 
this is what you deserve, the lake of fire. And this is what the Lord is going to give you unless you listen to the message. So what is this message that the Lord is trying to communicate to you that you refuse to listen to for one reason or another, whether it be the messenger or something else? Well, the message is simply this. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. John writes, for God so loved the world, actually Jesus said this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. You know, it's interesting that the word world always has a very negative connotation in Scripture. And the fact is we are all sinners and doomed to everlasting punishment. But God's love was so great that he sent his son into the world to save the world. And again, we understand that not everybody in the world is going to be saved. But nobody who is saved deserves to be saved. This is purely of his grace. This is the gospel. It's good news. Paul and Silas said to the Philippian jailer, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So what is this message? It's simply this. If you will trust the Lord Jesus Christ, not simply believe that he existed, not simply believe the facts regarding his life, but if you will actually look to him, take hold of his promise, rely on him to save you, Rest your whole case of heaven, your whole hope of entering heaven upon him. And if you will at the same time turn from your sins, those things that you do that are offensive to him, that are against his law, that are against the law of love, that not only uh, are injurious to him, but also to your neighbor, then you will be saved. God will forgive you of all of your sins. He will clothe you with a perfect righteousness. He will give you Christ's perfect record of obedience. He will credit that to your account so that you will be accounted perfect before him. And he, as I've said, will take away all of your sins. Now, the Bible says you need to be perfect to enter into heaven. But you are not perfect. Jesus, though, is. And if you will trust him, he will get you into heaven. On the day of judgment, the Lord will acquit you of every single thing that you've done, ever done that's wrong, and he will bring you into heaven. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. Does that sound like such an offensive message to you? The idea that God will give you full forgiveness, I mean, he will take away all of your sins and just remove them as far as the east is from the west, that he won't remember those things in judgment against you? that he will take what his son has done and he will give that to you as a, a free gift, a perfect record of obedience, that he will fully acquit you on the day of his judgment and welcome you into his kingdom and give to you eternal life, all because of what Jesus Christ has done and not because of what you've done. That doesn't sound like such a bad deal to me. When you think about the message, how can you object to that? How can you think that's such a bad thing that you don't want to hear? I mean, why do you hate it so much? I think it highlights the heart problem. The, the thing is, you don't want to admit that you're a sinner. You don't want to admit that you've done things that are wrong. You don't want to believe that you can't make it to heaven on your own. You also, perhaps, don't want to give up your sins. But those things are real. And God will, in fact, judge you for them unless you're willing to turn from them and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So those are the offensive things about the gospel. As we read earlier, those who are in darkness love the darkness, and they hate the light. And so they don't want to hear the truth. They just want to believe the, the errors that they have believed and go in their blindness to hell. Nobody really wants to go to hell, but that's the path that they'll choose rather than come to the light. But I want you to realize that this message is not bad news. It's good news. All you have to do is trust Jesus to save you. 
All you have to do is turn from your sins, and he will. So stop looking for excuses not to listen to the gospel. Stop criticizing the messenger. Instead, listen to this message, because if you don't listen to the message, or if you have heard it, but have not responded to it, you will perish forever in your sins. Listen to the message. Trust Jesus Christ and be safe. Well, may the Lord grant to us, to each of us, that we may hear this message. And may he grant to us in hearing that we may believe and have eternal life. Let's bow for a moment of prayer. And let's pray silently in our hearts that the Lord would apply his word uh, to our souls in a saving way.